historian. I'm writing a history of American babies in the 20th century. And I spent a lot of time in archives reading about the various sciences of infant care. And I use the plural deliberately. There are a lot of sciences that shape parenting practice and gain cultural power. And they did so from a fundamental ability to answer basic questions. How can I be sure to give birth to a healthy baby? How can I be sure the baby survives and grows up healthy? What future awaits my child? And what can I do to influence that future? And is that future perhaps determined by factors beyond my control, or can I shape it? So today I'm going to talk about parenting sciences, but particularly those drawn from 20th century baby books kept by American mothers recording the milestones in their infants' lives. I've looked at about 1,200 of them. And uh, I will ref also refer to other sources of information directed at parents by medical experts, government agencies, and marketers. And I'm going to analyze a little bit as well the fo what I call the folk science of parenting, but I do regard it as a science. I want to stress that many of our current scientific theories echo those of an earlier era, and more importantly, that many contemporary concerns about the power of the state and the marketplace to manipulate so-called scientific findings have historical antecedents. Although I want to be clear, I'm not arguing that nothing has changed. I see my job here today is to talk about the historical background to what we're dealing with today and to look at change over time and maybe lay the groundwork for some questions that are going to follow along. So what sciences appeared in baby books? If you can't read it, it says they both say, do not kiss me. That's a very important uh, aspect of the 1920s science. Um, what sciences appeared in baby books? I would say <clears throat> they fall into these two crude groupings, those that predict an infant or child's character and development, and those that attempted to ensure a child's future by directing parental behavior. Uh, these sciences are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they often operated in tandem or side by side. Now, I want to point out what I'm not talking about here today, and which I think is very important, is the fact that um, children direct their own upbringing. I believe that parents have agency, and I believe that children have agency, although the agency of parents is more easily recoverable for historians. And of course, I would have regarded it as a failure of many sciences um, and of public and private organizations to acknowledge that children's agency is an important issue. So what is science? I'll just define it as systematized knowledge gained through observation or experimentation. So a grandma who says, oh, I've got 15 grandchildren. I've systematically observed them, and I know what to do. I regard as possessing grandma science uh, <laughs> in the same way that we might talk about medical science. Um, among the predictive sciences, that spoke to parents about the futures of their children are phrenology, the, ver the study of the variations in the size, shape, and proportion of the cranium in order to determine a person's character and mental capacity, perhaps our first brain science. Uh, and astrology, the study of the influence of stars and planets on human affairs. If you go to the baby books, you will find phrenology charts and astrological data in early uh, baby books, phrenology in the early, late 19th, early 20th century, and um, astrology in baby books through about the 1940s. Um, what is notable about baby books is they present a number of different sciences. So you can find an astrology chart, a medical height and weight chart, and what I would call a folklore science, Monday's Child is Fair of Face all in the same volume. Lots of sciences. Uh, perhaps the most influential of the predictive sciences was eugenics, because it argued for the determinacy of heredity. In the United States, a eugenic science uh, became the basis for the sterilization of about 66,000 of the so-called largely unfit in the 1930s, and for the institutionalization of many, many more. Um, but eugenics had a broader reach and perhaps a greater impact as a parenting science via what we call better babies context. That's a beginning in 1908. These competitions assessed infants according to strict standards of physical and mental development. 
They expressed eugenic ideals, and they were rooted also in efforts to lower infant mortality. Uh, eugenic competitions reached their acme or nadir, depending on your point of view, with the Fitter Families for Future Fireside contests, in which, uh, like livestock competitions at the fairs, families were assessed to determine who had the best eugenic profile and therefore ought to be breeding. Um, like eugenic sterilizations, these contests uh, ended largely by the 1940s. Now, I do want to bring this up because I think people get uh, very unnerved by the advice and science coming down uh, from governments today, but I think the impact of the eugenics movement was perhaps far more severe and, and ought not to be forgotten. Uh, assessing the influence of these competitions on parenting is very difficult. They received a lot of attention from the media. They drew crowds to the events. They allied with child saving programs rooted in reforming family health regimens. And they were part, of course, of this larger effort to educate mothers in me the medical science of infant care and the psychology of child development. Yet it's very difficult to find evidence that any lessons learned from the competitions carried over into daily routines. Now, mothers <coughs> did paste in to their baby books the certificates that babies won at the Better Babies contest. But they also save clippings when babies won beautiful baby contests. And uh, these were held by newspapers. Sometimes they were, you would send in a photograph of, for the most beautiful baby. They had boardwalk parades of strollers, you know, who's the most beautiful baby. Um, so I'm not sure that parents took home the lessons embedded in the judging of babies about their diet health practices or they really viewed it, these eugenic contests as kind of a fun day at the fair. Uh, this is a, a little NAACP better beautiful babies. I'll let you be the judge who's the most beautiful. Um, the directive sciences that had the greatest impact on behavior drew from the synergy of medicine, developmental psychology, folk science, and the science of advertising. Baby books are full of advertisements for products, that you, and these advertisements use the language of medical science and developmental psychology to sell those products. Health pamphlets, social welfare agencies, government bureaus did their best, for example, to teach mothers about proper artificial feeding. The United States Children's Bureau, established in 1912, produced the pamphlet Infant Care which remains in print today and is the most popular U.S. government publication ever produced. Um, it inspired a, approximately 125,000 letters a year for much of its early history. People wrote to the government for advice about child rearing. And of course, the answers usually boil down to seek help from a doctor. Um, so there is a, a government effort and a social welfare effort to educate parents. Um, but what you really get in the baby books is, is the power of advertising merged with that. The cultural practice of recording an infant's life in a baby book merged seamlessly with the public health command to record an infant's growth and development and medical care, and with the effort to help working and middle class Americans join what one historian has called the Consumer's Republic. So in 1900, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company produced a 12-page pamphlet to record both insurance payments made to the company and health information. On the next to last page, it says, I was vaccinated against smallpox on blank, was vaccinated against diphtheria on blank, was physically examined by the doctor on blank goes on to suggest, quote, if there's a nearby baby welfare station, you should enroll your baby there. And then, of course, over time, these booklets were adapted to the latest medical advice. And so here's an example from a Metropolitan Baby book, quote, when I cried without reason, I was not taken up, jounced up and down, or rocked. My parents wished me to learn self-control and to be happy without too much attention. They knew that babies are often spoiled or made excitable when they are fussed over. And I cannot stress enough how much this 1920s really emphasized you never, that's the don't kiss me, you don't kiss babies, you don't play with babies before age two, and if you don't let a baby cry, you're, it's not going to develop healthy lungs. So science does change. 
But what about those advertisements? To what degree did advertisements influence the spread of new medical ideas? To what degree were baby books critical vehicles for health promotion in reaching working classes um, as well as the other efforts to reach the working classes through visiting nurse stations? A, we don't have much information. A study conducted in upstate New York in 1955 and 56 found that while 21 percent of mothers did not use any advice literature, and those that did use it most often turned to Dr. Spock, the other guides that they reported using came from the Pet Milk Company, Metropolitan Life Insurance, Prudential Life Insurance, Carnation Milk, and their diaper service. So uh, busy mothers look preferred to glance at a pamphlet on toilet training. Um, and so you have to ask, did Alvin Hickok Morris's parents learn about when to call the doctor from the nurses at St. Luke's Hospital where he was born or from this special rule time, wartime rules for babies in a Menon advertisement in the magazine his mother received in the hospital? Did his mother wallpaper his room with DDT-infused wallpaper? Oh. So there we have the science of advertising and science. Uh, yes, 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 that's true. DDT infused wallpaper, yes. <laughs> Many families. You were really worried? Why, about yourself? <laughs> Maybe you. Yeah, I don't, we won't go there. Okay. A lot of families, of course, lack the means or the desire to follow new medical and marketing imperatives, or perhaps were prevented from doing so by their, their racial isolation or by their location. So if you turn to oral histories and folklore studies, you find that many parents ignored very happily all of this scientific advice. A mother in Illinois recounted how, when her baby was dying of brain fever a few years earlier, the doctor arrived and, quote, he said he could not help my baby. A neighbor came in. We peeled onions, chopped them up, put salt over them and made a poultice, put one on each wrist, one on the bottom of both feet, and one across the chest, and we saved my baby. Of course, we worked all night when a doctor would not do that, end quote. Other parents voiced similar skepticism about the effectiveness of orthodox medical treatment. A North Carolina widowed grandmother who used turp turpentine and corn liquor to cure a granddaughter of stomach trouble bluntly complained, quote, doctors don't do much good. Um, a Kentucky mother who wrote to the Children's Bureau about her baby's colic reported trying her doctor's treatment, colic tablets, to digest her milk, and after it failed, tur she turned to home remedies, asafoetida and whiskey, calomel tea, castor's oil, and finally, Charles H. Fletcher's Castoria. Um, the later uh, is a proprietary remedy, and it really showed the effectiveness, I think, of um, advertising, which I would call the most effective of all parenting sciences. Fletcher's Castoria reached out to parents by distributing baby books in the 1920s, and it reminded mothers that it was a harmless substitute for castor oil, paragoric drops, and soothing syrups which, of course, were often recommended by doctors. Um, so medical science had to confront both folk practices and sometimes even its ally, advertising. Now, growing... <laughs> I, I hope, see, I hope it's making you relax about the science of today, which is my job here. Um, the growing cultural authority of medicine and the power of advertising a let products be sold as scientific, right? How soon is too soon? What do doctors say? Um, the, effectiveness, the effectiveness of these promotions, of course, can very easily be measured in sales, volumes, and profits, unlike those measuring the effectiveness of uh, medical care, where I suppose mortality and morbidity measures are harder to apply. Um, but advertisers were very, very much more effective, I think, than physicians in convincing people that, um, for instance, grandmother had it all wrong. 
Adverti doctors might say, don't follow what grandma does, but when you got that message from advertisers, it's much more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, it, it brings you into the, the world of science. Is your baby enjoying the result of progress? Um, and and you just see I, I you just see this over and over again the history of parenting science ah oh, the scientific babies, um, so for example while doctors gave advice on toilet training, marketers would sell things like the little toity brochure that accompanied free baby books to give mothers given to mothers and explains uh, how to use soap suppositories to train babies beginning at age three weeks. Um, so, I see you're all calming down about the science of today, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Now, consider this. This is advice from the 1920 handbook for mothers from the Children's Bureau uh, on a serious medical problem. Quote, convulsions are often caused by undigested food. So the author will quote that. Um, but then in her little booklet, which is sponsored by Procter & Gamble, how do you do that? You give an enema with small pieces of ivory soap dissolved in water to unload the bowel. So you take the science advice suppositories for, for constipation and you merge it, of course, with our product for that uh, answer. Um, the synergy of advertising science and medical advice can be seen in the growing pro number of products for babies and in the self-reported -prof professionally documented changes in family life. Oral history interviews conducted during the Great Depression uh, with families often find that they're discussing infant care products by brand name. Uh, Nanny Ruth Parks, a southern cotton mill worker married at age 14, told an interviewer in 1938, my baby don't cost much yet, just a little for her carnation milk. My milk didn't agree with her, so I put her on canned milk. The following year, another mill worker and former sharecropper in South Carolina reported in an interview that his daughter took carnation milk. Why carnation milk? Be I think because the carnation milk contented radio hour show had begun nationwide broadcasts in 1932 and had done an effective job of saying, this is the product you need. Another example of the combined power of advertising and medical science can be seen in the Medi uh, interviews with families where they all assured interviewers they bought cod liver oil for their children, although they didn't refer to it by a particular brand name. Uh, it's worth pointing out, but not belaboring, that while health advisors told parents how to bring up their children, advertisers uh, took a more positive stance and assured them that they could do so very easily just by buying the right products. Now, as American workers adapted to new regimented work routines, and as American corporations adopted new methods of bookkeeping, parenting advice increasingly demanded that children be reared on schedule and that proper accounts be kept to track their development. Like workers, babies had time cards, and these are courtesy of the Children's Bureau. A shift in language began to occur as children were said not to need <clears throat> proper upbringing, a kind of 19th century term, but good parenting or even more importantly, supervision. Babies need supervision. Uh, and so you could get a scientific record for recording your child's introduction to new foods, height, weight, etc. After World War II, this included um, an emphasis on children's self-regulation. If you're going to be a good worker, you need to self-regulate. You need to go from the time card to this internal self-regulation. And as American workers are moving from the manufacturing into the service sector, personality becomes important for success. So you need the right work habits, you need the right temperament suited for the economy. This, of course, makes parenting much more difficult. It's one thing to adhere to a daily regimen, it's another thing to satisfy the demands of raising your child properly. Um, and it even then starts to happen before birth. Quote, 1941 advice manual. His parents' attitude towards his coming during the months of pregnancy is setting the scene for their management of his early years. All of the inner and outer influences of his surroundings will so affect him individually that each of these babies whose general appearance is so much alike 
is already started towards a different destiny. And I will say that because destiny was considered so important and this early life was so important, it was always advised in this era to wait till a child was three months old or even a year old before you engaged in adoption so you could conduct IQ test. Now, we get a growing number of parenting uh, uh, imperatives from all sorts of things. Um, but we might ask, what, what changes over time? What's different, other than we don't have DDT wallpaper? And I would say there are two key areas that drop out of baby books um, and, and migrate into the advice literature that do change parental behavior. One is accidents. Uh, one mother in uh, 1914 recorded her, how her little boy burned his face with quicklime at the age of four months, three months, age of three months, he caught a button hook in his tongue, pulled out some of his tongue as a toddler, had a nail in his foot, and then fell while holding a bottle and got glass in his left hand. His mother records it all in his baby book. It's not from a hospital file or from a social welfare investigation. Mothers record their children's fall off of porches, down the stairs, out of cribs, out of high chairs. And sometimes you record laughing about how funny it was when their child fell down. After World War II, those accidents entirely disappear. I don't think it was better parenting or vigilant uh, baby proofing or children became less curious. I think the culture changed and mothers stopped recording it. Uh, similarly, uh, there used to be places in baby books for, just like you said, oh, my first accident they had for my first discipline where mothers record the first time they spanked or smacked their child. That has disappeared. Um, so I think it may have led to a kind of underground parenting that now is uh, people who don't follow the rules and I guess they get educated. Um, so parenting science, let me conclude, uh, is neither new nor is it, I think, any more threatening today than in past decades. In some ways, I'd say parenting science today is less threatening because at least we're not forcibly sterilizing people as we did during the eugenics era. I think the fascination with brain science and the directives it will inevitably lead to are bound to result in recommendations that will one day seem as silly as those of past decades. Don't kiss babies, it spreads germs. Make sure they get a healthy tan to prevent rickets. Let them cry a lot so they have healthy lungs. Uh, don't stimulate them by playing or their developing brains will be harmed. Um, I'm sure the parenting science of today will do some harm, but I'm sure it will be humorously presented by a historian in the future. Um, <laughs> more critically, I think that real parenting issues, like poverty, will continue to be ignored. Um, and as for the, uh, your Cameron government uh, five-a-day approach, and I, I thank Ellie for alerting me to this, I think it's very reminiscent of the hang tags from the uh, United States Children's Bureau, so I would suggest that maybe the Cameron government wants to make little hang tags for your daily regimen because, you know, uh, we Americans all turned out so perfectly because of them. <laughs> so let me just conclude and say thank you and remember. <laughs>